Hello and welcome to Eve's Dropping at the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Jose. And we're talking about Space Jam, A New Legacy. Space Jam 2. It's 25 years since the first and original Space Jam. You, I don't think, remember Space Jam. Or you maybe have never even seen it. I mean, I'm sure that it's one of those things that probably came out in the 90s and I wasn't interested and I didn't go see it. And I know it was a big success. But, um, I mean, my feeling... Well, you know, I'm interested in too many things. That's always been my problem. (laughs) You know, and I thought, well... Children's stuff was one of the things that I actually did not mind not seeing. Yeah, it know. very much was a children's film. And one of the questions I've got about this film is who is it for? But we'll get on to it. The first film was based on the year or two that Michael Jordan spent not playing basketball. So in the 90s, he, he was huge for Chicago Bulls. Mm. Uh, and then he retired from basketball and um, took up minor league baseball. And by all accounts, wasn't very good at it. And the idea is that in the film, they took advantage of his kind of year off and said, what was he up to? They just mm. show him playing baseball. But the story was very simple. Aliens come to Earth, uh, cartoon aliens. They steal the talents of a number of top basketball players. I, I, I mean, I was a kid, I didn't know basketball. I didn't, know, I didn't even know Michael Jordan, really. Charles Barkley was one of them, I can tell you that much. And I, I remember all the shots of them in the wheelchairs. It was really fun. And the Looney Tunes enlist the help of Michael Jordan to help them win a basketball game against the aliens. Mm. And it was a great film. I really enjoyed it. But I say all this with the caveat that I actually haven't watched it in 20 years, maybe. You know, so although I feel like I remember it very well and I feel like I would enjoy it a second time, I don't know whether I would. I may look at it and go, wow, this really is crap. And, you know, you have to be a kid to enjoy it. But it's very, very kind of beloved amongst people my age, right? The talk online around the new film, has a lot of reverence for the original. And you do look at all this chat going, how many of you have actually watched the original one recently? How much of this is the nostalgia? Is just the feeling of, well, I was a kid, I loved it. Well, let me tell you my (laughs) frame of mind. Yeah. My first impulse was, why the hell has Mike gotten me up so early to see this? Because we saw a 10 past 10 screening. And then I realized that I had been in such a rush to have a bath and have coffee and you know, get dressed and leave that I forgot to put my nicotine patch on. And I haven't, I haven't smoked for about uh, two months or so, yeah. a month and a half. You know, so then I couldn't tell whether my reaction was, Irritation I from hate the this film, yeah. right? Or, because actually it took me a while even, so you see, I was so far advanced in my non-smoking <laughs> that I didn't... It took me a while to even register that I hadn't put my patch on. That's very good. Yeah, well, it's not good anymore because I'm smoking now. But Today's the first day of the rest of your life. That's right. But anyway, I really... um, Hated is the wrong word, but it kind of... It made me sad, right? Because, (laughs) you know, here is the super expensive film which has nothing to do with art or even children's entertainment. Mm -hmm. And it's just a corporate project of the worst kind, right? Like you're looking at this film and all you're seeing is all these beloved characters, right? Like, you know, Wonder Woman and The Mask and Wicked and, right? Which kind of the copyright clearly belongs to Warners, right? And, you know, they're just there with the Looney Tunes kind of sucking up all the best of your childhood Mm. and selling you something horrid, really. That's my view of it. Yeah, so uh, before we go any further into that, let's briefly say what this film is about. Um, It is, in some respects, a recapitulation of the original story. A basketball player, this time it's LeBron James, is enlisted uh, by the Looney Tunes to help uh, save the world. Or, in fact, this time he enlists the Looney Tunes so he has, he's engaging in a fight with an algorithm uh, run by Warner Brothers computers, or in Warner Brothers computers, which is personified by um, Don Cheadle. And it's a very vague, you know, the, the, the algorithm feels like he's not recognised enough. Warner Brothers executives don't listen to his ideas, or at least that's what he feels. He feels he's too easily dismissed. And therefore he wants to get LeBron James, who is the biggest star in the world, use him to become very important. It's, it's pretty vague, right? And, but the thing is, it's kind of vague and not vague enough for me because I felt like in in the original film, it was aliens from space, 
take over the world with basketball. It was super, super simple. And in this, it drapes what is a simple, stupid premise with the lexicography of technological... And the thing is, the problem I have is that I know that algorithms and understanding social media and that kind of thing are the ways in which we now have to understand the world. Mm. We're always talking about Facebook and the algorithm and how it spreads misinformation, all this kind of stuff. But is it really necessary to clutter the film up with that mm. when it could just be so much more streamlined, right? Can I recapitulate on another level? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So basically the story is about LeBron James and his younger son and LeBron James being too hard on his younger son, wanting him to follow in his footsteps with basketball, whereas what the younger son wants to do is really design video games, right? And the whole lesson of the film is LeBron James learning to let his son be him rather than who LeBron James wants him to be. Yeah. Yeah. Be so, yourself. Yeah, be yourself. <laughs> so there's all this cheap pop psychology like... Yeah. I'm okay, you're okay, be yourself, <laughs> blah, yeah. blah, blah. And we've been talking recently, <laughs> we've been talking recently about family, just the, the vaguest idea of family being plonked into films, yes. and films kind of winding up with an idea of uh, a reconstructed family, or family's most important thing, blah, blah, blah. It's a very much blah, blah, blah. Very mm. easy to put in a film. Whereas actually, and again, I'll compare it again to the original film. It's not something I remember from the original film. It was all about Michael Jordan. Um... But I don't remember any really strong message to that. Like It really feels like, in the 90s, it did feel like those films were able to handle a little less messaging. It feels very forced into films these days. Another thing that I absolutely hated from the beginning about this film was that... So LeBron James is really just depicted as an aspirational, super-rich, uh, happy family... The first shot you see is in like uh, this mansion and it seems like Beverly Hills or something surrounded by other mansions with pools and you go into this huge basketball court and yeah, you're introduced to LeBron James and his children. And, you know, my first impulse was, my God, this is like, it's so aspirational. And then I was thinking, well, is there anything wrong with that? And, you know, why should, yeah, like poverty or want mm. <laughs> or you know racial exclusion intrude into this yeah can, can you not allow her aspiration but actually it began to bother me even more and more and it 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 the clincher for me was to find out that all of his family is played by actors I, it's not his real family even yeah. yeah i'm not sure why that was a surprise to you well um because it's represented as you know, you can't have LeBron James be LeBron James and then, you know, his children play by actors. I think you definitely can. Okay, well, I found the problem with that, right? So I think it's another way in which the film is cheating because, you know, what it's telling you is this is LeBron James and his family, right? Mm. And then it's a fantasy situation, right? But I thought at least, you know, if you are playing it that way, then, you know, I would have expected it to be his real family, which it wasn't. So you immediately begin with all kinds of falsenesses. Yeah? So it's a false family. It's a false representation. It's a false representation of a family. It's a false representation of a culture. You know, it's just there to sell you stuff. It's instrumental. It's like, you know, the culture industry at its worst. Well, yes, that's quite true. But um, I, I, I do sense what you feel about, the, um, about his family being played by actors, but... Um, I don't really agree with it. Okay. Um, but the idea of the film being here to Come sell on. you stuff... It's like the crown, as if the queen appeared in the crown and played herself, and everybody else was played by actors. Well, I mean, I mean just wait, be because Meghan Markle's probably going to play herself in season <laughs> 11, so we'll see what you think about it then. Well, we'll see. <laughs> um, I mean, when you have a, a, the star who is not an actor, everything else has to be there to carry him. That is true. You know, but then... I, I don't know. I think the film could have signaled it or whatever. Uh, it just felt off to me, really. Sure. Um, let's talk about it selling stuff, though, because mm -hmm. this is such a corporate project on a level that I didn't... I, I went into this film with very low expectations. Didn't expect anything of it. I had me liked too, the first film, very, you know, very strong memories of the first film, all that kind of thing, but I, that didn't mean I expected this to be good, and that really helped me enjoy the things that were enjoyable. But even with those low expectations... I hadn't realised what a... It, it felt like I'd paid to see an advert for Warner Brothers. Yes. You know? 
Um, a very badly made advert. Because... Very badly and cynically made one. So the thing is, in the first film, it was about the Looney Tunes and everything, and they're obviously Warner Brothers property. But it was just Michael Jordan playing with the Looney Tunes. It was, mm. yeah, that's what it was. Um, with this, Warner Brothers forms part of the plot. So LeBron James has been invited by Warner Brothers. The, the algorithm that Warner Brothers has, the uh, Don Cheadle algorithm, has identified LeBron James as the world's biggest star. We need to get LeBron James in to do X, Y, Z. And they bring in LeBron James on the strength of what this algorithm has told them. And he says, no, I'm not interested. And so the algorithm sucks LeBron James and his son into it. They become part of the computer. And that's where the whole action and the basketball match takes place. And within the Warner Brothers algorithm's world, the, the, um, the serververse it's referred to as, you get these like planets which represent different properties. So there's a Harry Potter planet. And there's a Matrix planet. Or maybe there wasn't a Matrix planet. There's certainly a Game there's, of Thrones There was a planet. Matrix thing. I don't uh, know if it was a planet. Yes, well, there was a Matrix thing we'll go on to. There's a Game of Thrones planet. And I said to you at one point, I can't understand why they're so keen on pushing Game of Thrones. Because it's universally accepted that it's dead now. Right. You know, it was the biggest thing for ten years. And then that final season killed it stone dead. But they're very keen on pushing it still. There's, uh, obviously, Looney Tunes have a big presence. They're still the kind of the main thing. And then when you get into the basketball game, as you intimated there are in the crowd there are all of these characters dotted around the place and none of them are drawn attention to but for my purposes at least i quite enjoyed watching you know spotting them Mm. so the masks in there i I did after the film write down all the references that i recognized so the matrix game of thrones harry potter are the three biggest ones casablanca's one yes and you see a scene from casablanca with lebron and bugs bunny put into it it's disgusting same thing with mad max fury road there's one of those yes um, disgusting there's uh, the mask you see the mask represented the Maltese Falcon you see that on one of the planets there's a hotel with the Maltese Falcon on it uh, a clockwork orange you see the Drukes um, the Wizard of Oz as mm. you suggested the Iron Giant is mentioned and you see him King Kong and Training Day and Training Day was an interesting one and this to me kind of signals what it, where I was going when I said who is this film for because Training Day is not a children's film no. and the way it's referenced here is with a line uh, and it's maybe the most famous line from Training Day, which is where Alonzo, spoiler alert, is being defeated and everyone's turning on him. And he says, King Kong ain't got shit on me. And it's when Don Cheadle's character is starting to lose in the basketball game. And he says, King Kong ain't got nothing on me. right? And then the, the camera turns to King Kong and he's like, what are you talking about? Mm. Um, and this is where I'm thinking, who's this film for? Because that's not a line for children. Now, it's not a line that children... It's not It's not like awful for children to hear that, and they took the swear word out. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that's a line for people to recognise. And the people who recognise it are me. Yes. And maybe you. Well, no. I mean, I think the film is made for guys your age. It is. Right. So I'm thinking, who's this film for? And the answer is, ostensibly, the film is made for children. But actually, the film is made for the people who made it. Mm. And those people are guys my age... Mm. And Warner Brothers. <laughs> and the film serves both of them. Well, let me tell you, guys your age working at Warner Brothers have not an ounce of imagination because the reason I'm saying that this film feels like it's raping all your childhood memories, right? You have all these beloved characters, yeah? You have them in situations that you remember them from, but you remember the, them being funny and witty and lovable and, you know, particularly Bugs Bunny, right? Like, you know, and here every joke is a thud it just nothing lands it's it's completely lacking in imagination yeah. and wit it's, and, and it exemplifies to me the worst of american culture which is all bigger louder more expensive yeah mm. kind of you know so it's not enough to have one cartoon character that you can use and make great jokes with no you've got to have a thousand right but you have a thousand you do nothing with them it's just just terrible and, and disgusting <laughs> yeah, it's and obviously it's all the Warner's, all the Warner's backlogs, all the Warner's properties, as you suggested, right? This is this is an advert for Warner Brothers. The Matrix thing that we mentioned is really heavy, right? They keep they they keep on making Matrix references to the idea of going into the computer, which is kind of fair enough. But still, this is a twenty-year-old plus movie, right? And again, it wasn't a kids movie; it was mm. fifteen rated over here, and like kids will see it and stuff. But it's it's an out of date reference, mm. basically. And again, it's a reference for me. And they're really keen on selling it. And you can only think that the reason they are so keen on selling it is because there are new Matrix films coming out. Yeah. It seems too too easy just to call it corporate, although it obviously is. It's somehow kind of worse than that in the, in the clunkiness of it. Um, 
the Casablanca stuff and Maltese Falcon stuff was kind of interesting to me just on the basis that even for people my age, that's quite an old reference. And I know. You know. But it just feels like it's raiding your back catalogue and spoiling it. Because if, had they done something witty, I mean, you know, I'm not a purist. I, I don't yeah. mind if, you know, those things are used and deployed. And if you can do something kind of, you know, smart that communicates something about now, great. Right? The thing is that... It's, it's, this is not only not adding anything, mm. it's actually taking away from, from it, right? Like it's kind of, you know, it's so clunky that it makes you look at the worst parts of that scene, <laughs> you know, and, and, and kind of eroding your pleasure and memory in the process. I really hate Well, fortunately it. for me, I didn't think the film was anywhere near strong enough to hurt what I thought of Casablanca. I mean, it, it's well, nothing. It will go away. It will go away. Um, and the thing is, I have nothing against, you know, adult references or references to adult or older works in kids' things. It's great. And you get a lot in Looney Tunes and a lot in cartoons. And you grow up years later and you see jokes that you didn't realise were there. You see references that you didn't realise were there. That's, that's totally legitimate and it's really great. And sometimes, I mean, there are, there are whole episodes of The Simpsons that are based on The Godfather or something. Sure. And kids just don't know. And you grow up later and you realise it was this whole reference. And that's great. It's great. So I don't have anything against that, but the fact, the thing is, when The Simpsons does it, or when old episodes of Hanna Barbera cartoons did it, or Looney Tunes cartoons did it, it had creativity. It was, it was making a parody or making a spoof or, or bringing something out of it. This is doing none of that. Had this film been funnier, or or more moving, or you know, some kind of commentary on contemporary culture or whatever, any of the above or a combination of the above, mm. none of it would have mattered, right? Like, you know, I mean, there were other films that were obviously, that obviously incorporated corporate stuff into, into it and I didn't mind. I don't like it, you know, mm. um, but the, I think this is just the worst offender because nothing, I didn't find that, well, I think I might have chuckled a couple of times, but, but nothing, very little was funny. Oh yeah, it's but, not devoid of bits and pieces that, that you enjoy. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, but it's... It's pretty bad. It's not making up for much. I mean, there were things that I enjoyed. When the Looney Tunes actually showed up, which takes a while, um, but when they actually show up and you start having fun with them, and actually it was when they were putting them into scenes from Casablanca and Mad Max, I thought there's a little, and The Matrix was the other one, there was a little bit of creativity going on here. And that's when I started to enjoy things. I Part of it was enjoying seeing characters that I like for the first time in Donkey's Years. So when Taz shows up, the Tasmanian Devil, I had a great time because he was one of my favourite characters as a kid. Mm. And I liked seeing him, you know, he's got a few bits, everyone's only got a few bits, but I liked seeing him. I rather, you know, I liked Bugs' presence mm. and I liked Daffy's presence. So those were fun, but actually then it all kind of stops. It grinds to a halt when you get back to the algorithm character because the algorithm has kidnapped the son and is sort of trying to turn the son against him. Actually, that's a plot point which is rather like Hook, mm. if you remember, where, where Dustin Hoffman's Hook is trying to take Pan's kids off him. Um, not done as well here. You know mm. I love Hook. Mm. Um, <laughs> I do. <laughs> and, you know, it's fair enough. It's developing that half of the plot, but it grinds everything down to a halt. And actually the madcap stuff and the really enjoyable, silly stuff, there isn't enough of in trying to develop this kind of serious part of the plot which it doesn't do all that successfully it's pretty by the numbers it loses what has been fun mm. up till then it makes sense how things kind of get resolved and like how the how the basketball game goes for instance they realize this is part of lebron's big realization that he has to let people be themselves because he's trying to get the team to play fundamentals and it's not working against these superstars mm. when they can play as themselves and be the looney tunes and do crazy things then they win so yeah it makes sense it takes a while to come around though and I wish, I just wish there'd be more. You know, when the Looney Tunes in the film are allowed to be Looney Tunes, you really get that sense that you always get with the Looney Tunes of that crazy world they live in, that anything can happen, there's silly things going on. Even some of that is happening in reference here with the duck season, rabbit season thing. That's a very old mm. Looney Tunes joke. But even then, there's a lot of enjoyment in that. The film just doesn't prioritise it nearly enough. You really think it should be doing that. That's where that's where it should all be, mm. but it just kind of fudges it down into this too self serious melange of oh family, oh LeBron's wonderful. We look at nineteen forties films, some of them, and they go, oh my God, you know, they were so ideological, right? Kind of selling you this idea of a family or mm. anti communist Yeah, some it's so um, heavy handed sometimes, 
but even the worst seem a model of subtlety in comparison to this one. Yeah, I mean, it's actually really disgraceful. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about uh, iRobot, if you remember the 2005, yeah. I think, or four adaptation yes. with Will Smith, right? Because the opening of that film took a lot of heat and it's still considered kind of a model of product placement. But I thought, you know, at least in iRobot, it was selling me Converse and JVC and all these companies that had paid to be in there. It wasn't just selling me the company that made it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what felt really insulting about this one. Yeah, I mean, well, because here it's not so much selling you the company that made it, though it is also selling you Warner Brothers for sure. But actually, it feels like it's fanning all of these characters, all of this history, yeah, as a way of embedding them as something so essential to the culture that it will be returned to you for sale in a little while, right? So it's kind of almost like amping up these products, renewing them, yeah, <laughs> bringing them back to your attention because there will be something soon for you with Wonder Woman or Wicked or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, you know, again... Yeah, I forgot you know, the DC stuff. We, we live in a capitalist culture. We're used to that. It's not necessarily a problem, but it's a problem here. Mm. Uh, and I just found it disgusting, really, like... Yeah, I mean, I've seen. I thought it was quite funny that it was selling the Matrix so hard because it made me think, what would Baudrillard make of it? Exactly. <laughs> no. uh-huh. Although there's, of course, quite an interesting thing I read not long ago because um, John Baudrillard is known as an influence on the Matrix, and in one of the uh, first versions of the Matrix script, um, they talk about the desert of the real with reference to John Baudrillard. It's a phrase of his mm. from Simulacra and Simulation, but they actually name him in an early. You know, Morpheus says his mm. name in the line of dialogue, which they took out. Um, but it was, I think, Lily Wachowski, might have been later, I can't remember, who said at one point, you know, the thing is, people really tie Baudrillard to the film and say it's such a, such a huge influence and it's based on Baudrillard. But when Neo opens up the book, Simulacrum Simulation, at the start of the film mm. to get that disc for, for the guy he's sending it to, the whole point is that the book is hollowed out. Mm. He stores the disc inside it. So the idea is that the book is empty. Mm. You know, which I'd never considered as an mm. idea. That, like, actually, it's this critique of philosophy, maybe. It's something that no one ever decided to take from, from that. Mm. Um, anyway. Anyway. A side note. Um, I didn't, well, it makes me think that there must be some new Game of Thrones thing coming, because why else would they be selling that so hard? Yeah, but not only that, I mean, you know, I remember kind of reading Marcuse uh, as a teenager, and he was saying, well, you know, one of the things that capitalism does is it says, well, we, you know, we live in the best of all possible worlds, and... You know, it tells it, it it trains you to to want this. Yeah, here is this fabulous thing you want it, right? Then it provides it for you. You, you know, you can go and buy it, right? And it mm. makes it makes you feel that if you live in the best of all possible worlds, and so you don't protest or fight or try to build something different because your life is so great, you can buy your Barbie or whatever. But I think even by those ideas, this film really fails because you look at this and say, who the fuck wants that? Like, mm. what kind of a world or a life is that? Like, who wants it? So, I mean, I, I thought it was obscene and disgusting and a complete failure on every level. And I want to also signal out, amongst all of this failure, Don Cheadle, who is an actor that I like very much, but who you know, I think is completely miscast. You, you cannot criticize LeBron James. He's not an actor, right? Mm. But I think, you know, Don Cheadle is playing a character a little bit like um, Angelina Jolie in Maleficent or something, yeah, kind mm. of. And he is given a lot of opportunities for flourishes with his character and so on that he just doesn't carry off, you know. I mean, mm. he, I love him as an actor. He can be wonderful. But he, let's say he doesn't rise to the occasion. <laughs> no, not quite. Um, the one, actually, this it's, it's, again brings me back to Baudrillard and the Matrix, funnily enough. Um, because his is a character who is, as far as the film goes, part of Warner Brothers. He's the Warner Brothers algorithm and he's the villain. And so, you know, you, you, you just read it as Warner Brothers is sort of the villain of this film. And um, that reminds me, and I suppose The Matrix was on my mind because it's all over the film, uh, that one of the criticisms that John Baudrillard had of The Matrix was of it being part of a culture that, that will sell you, the, the huge company that makes the film is selling you the idea that corporate culture is bad, but it's still selling you the film. 
Yeah. You know, and it resolves it the way it wants to, and it's still making four hundred million dollars off the film. The way that I read the algorithm, unlike you, so it's not you know that Warner Brothers is bad. The algorithm is the villain. Mm. It's actually uh, the algorithm is bad, but Warner Brothers is the universe. Yeah. Right. So you know the universe can exist without that algorithm. It can change algorithms. Yeah. It's like you cannot see beyond the world. The universe is Warner Brothers. Yeah, there is nothing beyond Warner Brothers in this yeah, film. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think that's one of the many problems. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It, it feels like it's getting to that point because, you know, we have the DC universe, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Star Wars has become a universe over the years. Yeah. And you do get all these things where people are talking about, wouldn't a crossover be great? You know, Disney owns Marvel and Star Wars. Wouldn't it be great to see a crossover? And you feel like when Warner Brothers is positioning a film as the Warner Brothers universe where Harry Potter <clears throat> can stand next to... The Matrix. The Matrix can the stand mask. next to the Clockwork Orange guys in the audience of a basketball match. You feel like we're really probably not that far away from it. That's going to be happening sooner or later. Yeah. You know, I mean, we've already got in this film, we've got the Looney Tunes showing up in Casablanca when they want to. Mm. Feels like that dystopian future is upon us. Yes. Well, um, <laughs> even more dystopian would be you know, to see this film again. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I definitely uh, recommend that nobody sees this. And I hope they lose as much money as possible having made it. Though I see from Wikipedia that that's not the case. I'm sure it's making good money. On, and I will say, though, you should still see the first one. The first one was a lot of fun. Well, I mean, It I... didn't have this project going on unless all my memories have betrayed me and it was all over that one. But it felt, it felt much more uh, you know, light. Yes. Well, I haven't seen it, and this gives me no incentive whatsoever to see it. So. Well, I, I may call in a favour one day and make you watch it with me. <laughs> you don't think getting up at dawn to see this with you was enough? I, I think you owe me big time already. I'd just like to clarify that I didn't make you do anything. I said, I'm going to be seeing this, and you can come with me if you want. Right. All right. <laughs> Uh, because so, I was well aware that it probably wasn't going to be up your street. Yes, well, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> so, thank you very much for listening. We're each dropping at the movies, and we are on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. On social media, we're on Facebook and Twitter, and the website is eavesdroppingatthemovies.com. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>